Good afternoon, I'm Michaela Miller with the Tuesday edition of the Our City COVID-19 News Show. This is the last week that the country will live under level 4 lockdown conditions as it draws to an end. Preparations are underway to prepare South Africa for life under level 3 lockdown which starts on the 1st of June. The National Coronavirus Command Council is due to brief the media on Wednesday at 12.30pm on the new regulations governing Level 3. The social cluster will follow with its briefing at 6pm. And now for your headlines. Premier Alan Windy visits the Cape Town International Convention Centre, which has been converted to a temporary hospital. Two schools have been temporarily closed after returning staff members tested positive for COVID-19. SA Jewish Board of Deputies raised 9 million rand to aid vulnerable communities in the country. Kenya's leading medical research facility is testing the efficacy of a herbal medicine known as Dupix as a possible treatment for COVID-19. And WHO Director General Tedros Ghebreyesus briefs about the work the World Health Organization is doing to combating the virus. On day 61 of the national lockdown, the current number of confirmed COVID-19 cases nationally stands at 23,615. There have been 11,917 recoveries and 481 deaths. The Western Cape has 14,978 confirmed cases with 7,221 recoveries and 318 deaths. The provincial government of the Western Cape has converted the Cape Town International Convention Centre into a temporary field hospital. It is scheduled to open on the 8th of June. The facility has 862 beds and will cater to patients with mild cases of COVID-19 who need hospitalisation and treatment, including the administration of oxygen. Premier Helen Windy has more. Hi, this is Alan Windy. I'm uh, standing here at bed number 862 at the Cape Town International Convention Center. This facility is a facility that has been put in place by the provincial government. Uh, it is according to our uh, curve and the need for extra beds in our system. We don't have sufficient beds in our hospitals and we've had to build an extra 1,400 beds of which 862 are right here in the convention center. A place that you normally would have come to for a jazz festival, a business conference, um, a trade show and now this is a place of uh, hope and recovery. And uh, so it's really great to be here to see what they've accomplished in the last two weeks in putting this field hospital together. And, and of course, there's going to be about 800 staff looking after the 860 uh, um, um, patients that are going to be recovering here in this, uh, in this hospital. And uh, we're going to be ready for opening on the 8th of June. A man and his son were arrested and detained at Manenberg Saps on Sunday for the illegal possession of a firearm and ammunition, negligent storing of a firearm and attempted murder. Initially, the man had flagged down law enforcement officers in Raimtaway, saying his son had been assaulted and had identified his alleged assailants. But the suspects in turn told the officers the 21-year-old man had fired at them. The officers found a 9mm CZ pistol with 12 live rounds. The firearm permit had expired. Two men, two women and a three-year-old boy died in a fire in Crossroads late on Monday night. A search of the property led to the discovery of the bodies of a man, woman and a three-year-old boy in the garage and another two bodies of a man and woman in the bedroom of the ground floor. Spokesperson for the City of Cape Town's Fire and Rescue Services, Jermaine Carlser, has more. Two men, two women and a three-year-old boy died in a fire in Crossroads late last night. 
the city's fire and rescue service received an emergency call at about half past 11 and when fire crews from Guguletu, Mitchell's Plain and Lansdowne Road arrived on scene, they found a double-story house on fire in Imboniso Road. A search of the property led to the discovery of the bodies of a man, woman and three-year-old boy in the garage and another two bodies of a man and woman in the bedroom on the ground floor. The fire was extinguished just before one and the entire area was cordoned off by the South African Police Service. Two schools have been temporarily closed after returning staff members tested positive for COVID-19. The primary schools in Vahala Park and Dolph reopened on Monday for teachers but shut shortly afterwards. The Provincial Education Department said those who had been in close contact with the COVID-19 positive staff would self-quarantine for 14 days. Spokesperson Pranak Hamad said schools had guidelines on cleaning and what to do should a case of coronavirus be confirmed or someone had been in contact with a positive case of COVID-19. Meanwhile, the SA Democratic Teachers Union has urged teachers to stay home if the schools are unable to apply proper safety protocols. The city of Cape Town is looking for ways to make its budget work in light of the coronavirus pandemic which has left it with an 860 million rand shortfall. The city still needs another 386 million rand for coronavirus initiatives. Mayor Dan Plato said the national government had not yet given in addition funding for the crisis. The city's income dropped as a result of loss of income from rates and tariffs, my city public transport fares, suspension of events by Cape Town Stadium and Cape Town International Convention Centre and decreases in parking and development fees. Plazo said the crisis would have a long-term impact on the city's finances. The Jewish Board of Deputies has created a 9 million rand fund in an effort to aid the most vulnerable communities in South Africa. The fund, currently active in nine provinces, works with various community action networks to ensure funds are distributed equally. We spoke to National Director Wendy Khan about the fund, leading medical research facility testing the efficacy of a herbal medicine. Um, the Jewish community felt that although we understand and we um, fully are, support the lockdown and the amazing way that it has slowed down the infection in our country, but we still recognize that it has had disastrous consequences for many, many people around the country. Um, the type of hunger and starvation that we are seeing around us um, is, is devastating. And the Jewish community has been involved in many, many programs and, and processes and initiatives to try and, and address the hunger and to try and alleviate it. Um, and we've been involved in many, many different projects, um, some of them the CANS, um, the CAN project that I know that began in Cape Town, um, but the model has, has made its way around the country now and many of our communities have adopted beneficiary communities with that model. Um, but we realized that the scale was just so great and that we needed to really make even more of a contribution. And um, we managed to find an incredible donor who has chosen to remain anonymous, um, who has really got the values around helping people and, and trying to alleviate stress. Um, and that amazing contribution was followed by other contributions by members of the Jewish community, all of them with the express purpose of dealing with the crisis of food in our country and, and with the um, objective to make sure that the funds would be used in the most effective and strategic way that that food would reach people's tummies. Um, in the initial phases of our outreach pro processes throughout the lockdown, we've been working with an NGO um, called the Angel Network, and they really are angels. They've got a phenomenal uh, network of NGOs around the country that they work with, um, and we needed to work with professionals, people who knew the best way that we could deliver the relief to people who need it. Um, and that's really been a problem 
is, is making sure that all the aid that is distributed is really finding its way to the people that are suffering the most. So we've decided we've decided to partner with the Angel Network, um, and we're working closely with them in terms of the distribution of the relief. Um, we are working in, at the moment, eight provinces around the country. Um, we're very much trying to focus on what we call the forgotten people, people who unfortunately are not falling within the net of many of the other distribution systems. Um, and I can just share with you that, that two of the areas that we are very, very worried about, uh, number one are the rural communities. Um, and there's nobody there to develop plans for them, and there's no one there to really, really worry about um, their needs and, and their problems. They are, in, are many often in such remote areas that they are the forgotten people. Um, and also uh, refugee communities, who unfortunately, are not, um, do not qualify for government funding and do not qualify for funding under many of the other funds. So we're trying to find these people. Um, we had a very meaningful experience um, meeting a community in an area called Nobody in Limpopo. Um, and I think that exemplified much of what we're trying to do with the project. We're trying to find the nobodies of the country because for the Jewish Board of Deputies, nobody is nobody. Um, it's difficult to say, but I'm thinking um, we probably a third way through the funds. Um, and we're trying to make them last because we've it's a long process ahead. Um, and we're also hoping to build the funds so that we further uh, relief to people who are in need. Absolutely. Um, please reach out to us. Um, our email address is sajbd at sajbd.org. Um, yeah, if there is a community that is in distress, they should contact us. And, you know, we're not able to help everybody. That's the truth that, you know, 9 million rand sounded like a lot when we started. But unfortunately, there's such a great need out there that it's actually, um, we're, we're not able to, to fulfill everybody's uh, requests. But we do our best. And um, yes, I think the CAN network is an unbelievable model. And congratulations to Cape Town for coming up with it. Um, because it really is taking aid directly from donor communities to recipient communities and, and making sure that the exact needs are, are, are met with. And I really do think that if, particularly in, in big metros, that is the way that we should be proceeding. Sadly, I don't think this crisis is going to go away anytime soon and this is something that we'll be dealing with for a long time. So we, we would love funds and I can just guarantee that those funds will be used responsibly and they will be used effectively. And again, um, the best way is just to contact us, sajbd at sajbd.org. It's now time for a short break, but when we come back, we'll be looking at a Project Hope SA, an organization that is creating jobs for performers. Continentally and internationally, we'll be looking at Kenya's leading medical research facility, testing the efficacy of a herbal medicine for a vaccine for coronavirus and an update by the World Health Organization. Stay with us. Welcome back. You're still tuned in to Channel 263 on DSTV on the Tuesday edition of the Our City COVID-19 show on Cape Town TV. Project Hope SA, an independent organization bringing relief to people in the entertainment industry, is tirelessly working to create jobs for performers who are currently without any source of income. Let's have a look at what founder Haley Bennett had to say. The Hope Project SA really was born about six weeks ago. Um, coming from a background, as I said, of um, entertainment, I'm a professional dancer. I was a professional dancer before having kids and then started with choreography and production. Now we, we are so fortunate to boast a whole troop of creatives and people that we work so closely with. Uh, my business partner, Liam Anthony, is from Cape Town, in fact, and we've been producing phenomenal shows and in February, at the start of February, we were in the midst of creating a production for, for Kenya and we received cancellation and what ensued thereafter was just, it was terrifying for us, for, for our people 
everything that we've been working on for the year, um, everything is either postponed or canceled. And the reality for us has become that not only did we need to do something for our small business to try and weather the storm and have something to come back to after this, but our, our biggest problem and where the Hope Project started from is we worried about our people. Uh, the community of freelancers in South Africa are, it's, it's terrifying. Um, it actually started after after lockdown started, we, we started thinking about green screen solutions and virtual entertainment, but the, the reality of it is entertainment is live. And our clients were saying, well, oh, you know, it's all nice and well, Haley, we'd love to try and help you guys. And we love the TaylorMade group. We love dancers, even if, it's people using other companies. It's not just about us. The, the reality is people that have devoted their lives to the arts, to performance, to stage technicians, stage managers, uh, makeup artists, everybody is, they have no solution at this point. People are trying to think out of the box, but the reality is there's no sort of let up in the next few months, if not for the rest of the year with live eventing being canceled. So Stephanie, currently it's centered around dancers and entertainment and trying to, to, to make a way for us to help them, whether it's through relief or providing jobs. But the Hope Project in itself is actually something that we've been passionate about and we've been wanting to start for so long and we haven't had the time. And now, thank goodness, well, not thank goodness, we found ourselves with the time. So we've, we've married the two. We've married the, the idea of hope and the idea of creating something for a broader community. And then we're bringing in a means to try and create a project that can run parallel to what we do. We, we, we use a pool of freelancers, performers in everything that we do, whether it's national productions, as I said, we've traveled to Nairobi, we do Seychelles contracts, we do wonderful work. And people always wanna know, how do we get involved? Where do I learn? Where do I learn to dance? Where do I learn to sing? And I mean, there's a pool of the people that we work with from musicians to bands and all of those people, they're all sitting without work. So we would like to create a platform where we can start mentorship. So even after the pandemic and once we weather the storm together and life as we know it, we would like it to return even in better where we can now help. The, we can start looking into the easiest ways to find us on the website, on social media, the, the Hope Project USA. Um, on the website, you can find out all the information you can find out about our face masks that we've now started to, to manufacture. Uh, we know everyone is in need of help at this point. And instead of just asking for a donation or a handout, we, we wanted to try and provide a service, a great service, um, wonderful protective face mask with filters so that we can offer you a face mask, you can offer us um, some funds, we can then employ people. Currently, to date, we actually by employing 10 of our um, freelance dancers and performers to help us with deliveries and collections and the admin. You know, we, we're just diversifying in our skills. Uh, we've also got eight seamstresses that we've, we're employing and we're hoping to just increase and, you know, create the, um, the awareness of what we're doing. It's more than just face masks. It's more than just keeping your, uh, each other safe. It's also about creating this awareness and helping one another and giving each other hope. The staff at the Sensit Haven, Rest Haven Old Age Home in Strand have called on disaster management officials to visit the facility following two deaths and 32 positive cases of COVID-19. A member of staff told Cape Town Times 60 tests were conducted at the home of 12th of May, 32 of which proved positive. Now they are dealing with a shortage of caregivers too. The offices of the Methodist Church of Southern Africa obtained appropriate PPEs for staff and ensured the premises were disinfected. Many countries have been in search of a cure and vaccine for coronavirus. In Africa, Madagascar has launched COVID Organics, an organic herbal concoction it claims can prevent and cure the virus. Kenya has now joined the search too with East Africa's leading medical research facility testing the efficacy of a herbal medicine known as Dupix. Voice of America has more on this. The search for both a cure and a vaccine for the coronavirus has intensified around the globe, including in Kenya as medical researchers race to find the elusive remedy. 
Dr. Festus Stolo of Kenya's Medical Research Institute is taking the lead in finding out whether a herbal-based drug will be effective against COVID-19. Zedupex, developed in 2015 by Kenyan researchers, has been used in the treatment of herpes. Dr. Tolo says his team does not know yet whether the drug will work against the virus. We have started looking at the pre uh, clinical uh, efficacy of this product. We are still on very early stages. We cannot be able to really say. Knowing that uh, the herpes simplex virus is a DNA virus and the coronavirus is a RNA virus, uh, this really means that uh, we need to first of all confirm, check whether there is activity before we can be able to really say this is a product which we can explore further for COVID management. Rudy Eggers is with the World Health Organization. Eggers says that standardizing the various herbal cures could be quite a challenge. In, in other medicine, we find that there are very specific levels of the uh, active ingredient in it. And in herbal cures, frequently you find very varied um, uh, components and then also levels of those components in there. So, in fact, you would have to standardize these cures to make sure that you know what is in them and what component is actually acting. So that's quite a, a step to, to be taken before you can really evaluate these cures. Dr. Kefa Bosire, who is at the University of Nairobi, also has reservations about traditional cures, saying that mass production could be an issue. The immediate challenge we would face is getting sufficient quantities of the plant so that we can prepare them to, to supply the number of patients that may require it on a short notice like we have experienced during this pandemic. And uh, so this would require uh, a lot of work to go into identifying the best way to upscale the growing and uh, the collection of these materials. Despite these hurdles, researchers at Camry are pressing ahead with their study of herbal treatments for COVID-19. Lenny Rovaga for VOA News, Nairobi. The first winter cold front has brought with it much needed rain, but also warnings about dangerous weather conditions. Local government, Environmental Affairs and Development Plan in MEC, Anton Pridal, said the very cold weather had created new challenges for the public as well as emergency services. He cautioned motorists to be aware when travelling over the next few days, adding the disaster risk management centres were activated. The Southern Africa Weather Service has predicted gale force winds, high seas and snowfall on some of the mountain passes in the province. Member states of the World Health Organization have met to figure a way to respond to COVID-19. In the following video, WHO Director General Dr. Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus informs us about an organization's work in combating the virus. Member states came together to pass a historic resolution on our collective response to COVID-19. Today, I would like to take just a few minutes to summarize very briefly WHO's work on COVID-19 in seven areas. Leadership, analysis, communication, supplies, expertise, research, and preparedness. First, leadership. Since the beginning of the pandemic, WHO has worked day and night to coordinate the global response at all three levels of the organization, providing technical advice, catalyzing political solidarity, mobilizing resources, coordinating logistics, and much more. In early February, WHO published our strategic preparedness and response plan, giving countries specific and concrete measures to prevent, detect, and respond to transmission of COVID-19. We updated the plan earlier this month with an estimate that WHO will require 1.7 billion US dollars to fund our response to COVID-19 this year. So far, almost 800 million US dollars has been pledged or received, leaving a gap of just over 900 million dollars. 
with the United Nations Foundation and the Swiss Philanthropy Foundation, we launched the COVID-19 Solidarity Response Fund, which has so far raised more than 214 million US dollars from more than 375,000 individuals, corporations, and foundations. And thank you so much to all who have contributed. Second, analysis. Throughout the pandemic, we have monitored, analyzed, and assessed trends and provide advice at the global, regional, and country level. And we will continue to do so. Third, communication. We have developed risk communication tools for parents and children, health workers, employers, faith-based organizations, and more. We have held more than 50 press briefings, and we have convened weekly member state briefings to create a platform for countries to share experiences and ask questions. And to fight the infodemic, we have worked with multiple tech partners, including Facebook, Google, Instagram, LinkedIn, Messenger, Pinterest, Snapchat, Tencent, TikTok, Twitter, Viber, WhatsApp, YouTube, and more. And like to thank all these tech industries for their support in fighting infodemic. For supplies, WHO has shipped millions of diagnostic tests and tons of personal protective equipment to more than 120 countries. And we will ship much more in the weeks ahead. In Africa, WHO and the Africa Centers for Disease Control and Prevention work together to expand testing capacity for COVID-19 from just two countries to 44. Fifth, expertise. We published our first comprehensive package of guidance for COVID-19 on the 10th of January. And since then, we have issued almost 100 technical documents. We have constantly updated and adapted that guidance to make it applicable in the local context. We have also provided online training for more than 2.6 million health workers with 10 courses in 25 languages through our openwho.org training platform. Sixth, research. In early February, WHO convened more than 400 researchers from around the world to identify research priorities. We're tracking more than 700 clinical trials globally. And in March, we launched the Solidarity Trial to generate data quickly about which treatments were the most effective. More than 3,000 patients have been enrolled in 17 countries. Last month, WHO joined forces with President Macron, President Ursula von der Leyen, and Melinda Gates to launch the Access to COVID-19 Tools Accelerator to scale up the production, distribution, and equitable access to vaccines, diagnostics, and therapeutics. Ten days later, the European Commission hosted a historic pledging event at which world leaders from more than 40 countries pledged 8 billion US dollars for research into these life-saving tools. Seventh, preparedness. Since the first cases were reported, we have worked day and night to prepare countries to prevent, detect, and respond rapidly to the arrival of cases. In collaboration with the International Maritime Organization, the International Air Transport Association, and the International Civil Association Organization, we have developed technical guidance for ports, airports, and ground crossings. We have also established the COVID-19 Partners Platform to match country needs with resources. So far, more than 125 countries are actively using the platform, and 50 donors have entered their contributions. As you can see, WHO has been extremely active, and we will continue to do everything in our power to support countries, 
suppress transmission, and save lives. At the same time, we're working to ensure our other work continues as much as possible. From the beginning, I asked our Deputy Director General, Dr. Susanna Jacob, to continue focusing on leading our other work on universal health coverage and healthy populations. I'm glad to report that, so far, the majority of that work is continuing as normal. As you know, the world was already off track of the triple billion targets and the sustainable development goals. And there is no question that the pandemic threatens to set us back even further. That makes our task even bigger, and we must all redouble our efforts as a global community. Once again, thank you all for your service and solidarity. I look forward to working with you to advance our shared mission to promote health, keep the world safe, and serve the vulnerable. I thank you. Well, that's all from the news front. When we come back, Stephanie Pitt will share your thoughts about the Western Cape going to level three and what's trending on Twitter today. Stay with us. Welcome back. You're still watching the Our City COVID-19 show. I'm Stephanie Pitt. We like to keep our viewers up to date about what's happening in Cape Town and in the Western Cape on our Facebook page. Yesterday, we asked our viewers what they thought of the President's speech and how they felt about the Western Cape moving to Level 3. These are some of your comments. Lee Williams says contradictions regarding tobacco ban still cashing in on illegal smokes. Corruption on the highest level. Nicolene Tobias says really now they are contradicting their own laws. If alcohol is going to be sold, what behavior will it cause? Gerti Spark says, I think we have a very weak president. While Heidi Abrams Hanekom says, I can go back to work on Monday. Very happy and grateful after being home unpaid for two months. Now let's have a look at some of your videos. Um, I think being a citizen from South Africa, I share the overwhelming emotion and excitement along with the rest of the nation. But at the same time, um, I hold lots of concern in my heart due to the fact that our president has stated um, we will be lifting to level three, but at the same time, our country has not reached its peak yet, which means that our numbers are yet to elevate and rise. Um, but I think my massive concern lies in the fact that more people will be able to do activities and at that same time, more people will be using public transport to travel to work. I make an example of myself and I say that um, I'm really concerned because um, many people will be coming into contact with others who might be carriers of the virus. And this is a severe worry. Um, and I know that as much as I am happy at the fact that we will not be constricted to our confined areas, I know it raises much questions within our community. So personally, I think this is a very, very good thing. You know, there's a good side to this because it's going to boost the economy. We know for the past couple of months, the economy has just hit rock bottom. So I think this is a very, very good thing. Boosting economies, boosting people. Win-win. It's a terrible idea. It's a war zone as it is. We don't even have enough infrastructure to even cater for everybody. So I feel like it's a bad idea. Western Cape should stay on level five. People are going to die. I know this sounds bizarre coming from somebody that's at work but i feel like only essential jobs should yeah, continue to operate everybody else stay at home i didn't even know i was going to be able to it but I, I honestly don't really know what to think because i'm not i'm in between believing that the virus is that bad and it not being that bad because i haven't seen a word of anyone with the virus here and I feel good and I've been in and out of stores and for me it's like I don't see it so I don't like the piece of it. In my opinion I don't think we are ready at all. If you take a drive around, if you walk around in, in the high risk communities, um, you still see people not practicing social distancing, um, masks not being um, worn. 
Uh, it's, it's basically we're in phase one already and to go from level four to level three is, is just an irresponsible decision from, from government, you know, sending kids to school again. We've heard that teachers are already at school but still waiting for sanitary uh, products to be delivered by the education department. Um, so what does that tell you? As a nation, we are not ready yet to move from level four to level three. President Ramaphosa's speech on Sunday night caused major controversy after he announced that the country would move to level three and that the ban on cigarettes would continue while alcohol would be sold with restrictions. Many citizens felt that the sale of alcohol would lead to an increase in crime and that lockdown regulations were contradictory. We saw split views from citizens concerning the Western Cape moving to level 3, with some thinking it was a good decision, while others disagreed. We'd like to know your views on burning issues during this pandemic, so we'll be posting burning questions on our Facebook page, Our City CT. You can also follow us on Twitter at Our City CT. Let's have a look at the popular hashtags on Twitter today. Hashtag pray for Menzi Ngubane. The legendary and award-winning actor is battling for his life in the Charlotte Matake Hospital and is said to be suffering from kidney problems. Hashtag day 61 of the lockdown. Just three sleeps to go before lockdown restrictions lift a little, giving South Africans more freedom to move and work. After the ad break, Michaela Miller will be sharing information on resources and places of safety that you can access during this period. Stay with us. Welcome back. You're still tuned into Our City, The COVID Show with me, Michaela Miller. For your latest news around the COVID-19 pandemic and to see what other Cape Townians are doing to keep safe, tune into Cape Town TV daily. These are some organisations helping communities stay safe during this period. That's all we have for you today, but if you have something to say, we want to hear from you. Send your comments, news and questions to us via Facebook at Our City CT, on Twitter at Our City CT, or get in touch with us on email on Our City at CapeTownTV.org. You can also call us on 021-448-0448. From me, Michaela Miller and the Our City News crew, enjoy the week and goodbye.